Hey, everybody. Welcome to Talking Scripture, a podcast where we illustrate relevance and application of the scriptures in Come, Follow Me. We also dive into the history and cultures of the text. Thanks for taking the time to share and subscribe to this podcast. For show notes, head over to our website, TalkingScripture.org. Welcome to Talking Scripture. I'm Mike. And I'm Bryce. And today we're going to do Revelation 19, 20, 21, and 22. And these chapters talk about how the Savior is going to win. Everything's going to be good. And even though things are going really bad for the saints in John's day, things are going to work out. Things are going to be good. And so in the 19th chapter, they're going to be excited because the whore of all the earth has gone down. And so they sing, there's this hallelujah chorus that goes on in the beginning of the 19th chapter. And then we have the marriage supper of the lamb. And there's essentially two suppers in this chapter. There's the supper of the great God, which is where the wicked are being consumed by the beasts of the field. And this is coming out of the tradition of um, Ezekiel 38. And then the marriage supper of the lamb is the meeting with the savior. And if you remember in ancient Near Eastern religion and ritual, the final part of Yahweh's victory over the forces of chaos is the feast with Yahweh. So this is coming out of uh, Exodus 24, where Moses and Nadab and the 70 sons of... of uh, Abihu. Thank you. They go up to the mountain and they feast with Yahweh and they eat with him. This is also coming right out of Third Nephi, where the Savior feeds them. And it says that they're full and he provides the food. And so this is the victory. This is the king is going to come. And it's so Dr. Covenant section 27. 27, yeah. When I come, we will feast together and here's who's going to be here. And Yeah. So this is good. And, and I believe we practice this every Sunday, Bryce, when yep. we take sacrament. It's a foreshadowing of it. Yeah. So you're either at the feast or you are the feast. Ouch. So this is one of my favorite symbols in all of the gospel. And that's saying something because I love symbols. When my wife and I were married, it was a Saturday morning. It was spring break, and uh, we, you know, were late getting an appointment. As, you know, as the temple fills up quickly, it was a Saturday morning, and the only time we could find was seven fifty a.m. in the Salt Lake Temple, and we both lived in South Jordan. Well, we were supposed to be there an hour and a half before the ceremony, so I needed to, you know, we needed to be at the temple at six twenty a.m. And we lived about an hour away, and so I picked up my bride-to-be that morning at 5 o'clock in the morning. So can you guess what she did the night before? If I'm picking her up at 5 o'clock in the morning, she spent all night getting ready. And I suppose if someone had said why, um, she probably would have said, this is my wedding day, and I want to be more beautiful for him than I've ever been before. And oh my goodness, was she. Picking her up that morning, she was just an absolute vision. And that image of a bride on her wedding day is the second coming, wanting to be ready. There's a beautiful scene in The Merchant of Venice by Shakespeare. Bosanio and Portia are engaged to be married, and Bosanio sees her, and this is what Portia says to her engaged husband. You see me, Lord Bosanio, where I stand such as I am. Though for myself alone, I would not be ambitious to wish myself much better. Yet for you, I would be troubled twenty times myself, a thousand times more fair. I'm fine with how I look, but for you, I wish I were a thousand times more beautiful. That's the spirit of the second coming. For him, I want to be the best I've ever been. So here in symbolism, we are the bride. We collectively are the church of God. So symbolically, I am the bride. And at some point, verse 7, this is Revelation 19, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. Now, what does a bride need to be ready on her wedding day? She needs a dress. She needs a wedding garment. Verse 8, to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. And then this wonderful line, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Every one of us, when Jesus comes, the call will go out, get ready. Put your dress on. 
So gentlemen, bear with the symbolism. This is beautiful symbolism. Everyone to your closets and pull out the wedding dress of your righteousness. Now let's suppose I have not been righteous. What will my dress look like if I have not? If the linen is my righteousness and I haven't been righteous, I go to my closet and there's nothing but a rag? What are the chances I would show up to the wedding to marry Jesus wearing nothing but a small rag? If that's all my righteousness stitched, would you actually go to the wedding? No way. I would run. And that's kind of the spirit of the second coming. Those who have not stitched a wedding dress of righteousness will flee him and not want to be there. But I want you to just picture the typical Latter-day Saint who is not perfect, does not do everything right, but wants in his or her heart to be righteous and is trying and reads their scriptures and prays and goes to church and loves their children and serves in the church. And I'm just every day I'm trying to stitch that robe of righteousness. And so the announcement is made, everyone to your closets. And if this is fulfilled and to her was given, linen's clean and right, which is, you know, righteousness. Imagine this Latter-day Saint goes to the closet, opens it up, and sees this absolutely beautiful dress, the most beautiful dress she's ever seen before. And she puts it on. Now, tell me how she walks to the wedding feast. Tell me how she feels as she approaches her groom. That's the second coming. That's the goal a lifetime of righteous deeds. Nothing over the top, just normal every day, what we're expected to do righteousness every day. And when he comes, we will put on the culmination of our righteousness, every deed, every tithe, every offering, every act of service, every well-intended, heartfelt act of love. And we wear this beautiful dress, and I can just picture that peace and serenity and excitement and thrill that will come over that bride as she knows he's on his way to pick her up. That's the second coming. We meet him, we marry, we feast, and that's the moment we're trying to get to. We kind of practice this all the time with our families. Like, for example, when my son got married, we had a big feast to celebrate two families coming together. And this is ancient, and it's this coming home. And so this is Thanksgiving. This is Christmas dinner with the family. Just imagine you come to church and you have a feast. In early Christianity, that's what they had. They had a big feast. And so that's why some of Paul's letters read kind of funny, because not everybody got there at the same time. And so Paul said, hey, don't eat all the good stuff. Um, Let everybody get there. Don't uh, make it so when the people that get there at the end, all that's left is kale, because we know what kale is good for. Just throw in the garbage, straight in the trash. That's what you do with kale. And so the marriage supper of the lamb is, it's highly symbolic, but we're practicing this all the time. And we're married to Christ. This is a covenant. This is a binding. Another thought, I find this interesting. It's verse 10, 1910. It says, I fell at his feet to worship him. Who's he falling? Who's John falling in front of? It says, he said unto me, see that thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant and one of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. I think what's happening in verse 10 is that the angel that's with John, and in scholarship they call this person a psychopomp. A psychopomp is like a guide, an angel that takes you through these visionary experiences. For some reason at this point, John mistakes this angel for Jesus. And so this is the way I'm reading it. And he falls down and he worships him. And the angel, though he's speaking as if he were Jesus, he is not Jesus. And so Joseph Fielding Smith talks about this, and it's in a lot of our literature, the idea of divine investiture of authority. In other words, that a person who represents God can speak as if he were God. So for example, Jesus can speak the words of the Father. Um, In section 29 of the Doctrine and Covenants, in the very first verse, we know that it's Jesus who's speaking. But if you read later in the section... It gets kind of clunky. So section 29, verse 1 says, Listen to the voice of Jesus Christ, your Redeemer, the great I Am, whose arm of mercy has atoned for your sins. But then when you get to verse 42 of section 29 of the Doctrine and Covenants, it says this, 
But behold, I say unto you that I, the Lord God, gave unto Adam and unto his seed that they should not die as to the temporal death until I, the Lord God, should send forth angels to declare unto them repentance and redemption through faith on the name of mine only begotten son. So in verse 42, it sounds as if the father speaking, yet in verse 1, it's the son. Verse 46 says, But behold, I say unto you that little children are redeemed from the foundation of the world through mine only begotten. So in section 29, and this is in lots of places, but in section 29 of the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord speaks as if he is the father, and he can do that. He's been invested with that authority. And so another way to read Revelation 19, verse 10, is this angel has been invested with the authority to speak as if he were God. It kind of unpacks some of that stuff. We see a bunch of this going on in Moses and other places, and occasionally I have students who say, wait, who's talking? So in in modern parlance, in, in the revelations of the Restoration, we like to say that all revelation comes to man through the Son, that the Father has invested the Son with the authority to represent him. So... Back to dualism. Let's talk a little bit about 19. So you got the two suppers, the supper of the great God, as is referenced in verse 17, is pretty rough stuff. And this is Ezekiel 39 and section 29 of the Doctrine and Covenants. So specifically, you're going to want to read the 39th chapter of Ezekiel and section 29 of the Doctrine and Covenants, verses 17 through 21. And so without getting too much into it, this is where the evil forces have been destroyed, and then the animals are invited to come eat them. So, you know, this is what John's doing. He's playing with these dualistic symbols. And then if you go to the end of the 19th chapter, it says this in verse 20, the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him and which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshiped his image. These were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with, and then Joseph crosses out, the letter S. So the remnant were slain with the word of him that sat upon the horse, which word proceeded out of his mouth. And so it's this idea that the word of God is going to govern men. I'm not going to get into who the false prophet is. You know, there's a lot of ink spilled on that all throughout time. They talk a lot about the antichrist. Early Christians talked about, you know, who is the antichrist? I like the, the word anti can mean a lot of things. One thing it can mean is to be against but it can also mean to mirror. I think we can all agree that the adversary is really good at mirroring or mimicking Jesus. And I think John is being very deliberate to show that that's kind of what Satan does. He tries to imitate and he tries to tear down and he does it through mimicry. Well, here, remember how the dragon was red? When Jesus comes, he comes dressed in red. Again, it's that play on I am the Messiah, worship me. But Jesus comes dressed in red because he took upon us his sins. He earned every drop of that red. Satan never did. And it's always that I'm trying to come off as something that I'm not. Are you fooled by an imitation? There's the Lord's wine, and then there's this cheap imitation that's alcoholic that intoxicates you. Yeah. That's what he is. He's an imitator. Yeah. So he's going to be bound in the 20th chapter. It's funny, the book of Revelation is telling the story of the end, and then once the thousand years begins, in seven verses, we're at the end of the thousand years. So chapter 20, verse 1, begins the beginning of the millennium, and then in verse 7, it's the end of the millennium. So clearly, the story we're trying to tell isn't, here's how things are going to go from here on out. It's getting us to Christ. It's getting us to Jesus, so we rest with him. And so, yes, there's a literal millennium coming, but there's also a symbolic millennium, and that is the whole point of the Scriptures is to get you to Christ, to get you into His presence so that you can rest with Him. And then, once you do that, here's how it ends. So we're going to focus not so much on the millennial state, because it passes really quickly over the millennial state. So let's jump to the end, which is both judgment and the cleansing, the destruction. So let me take judgment. Revelation 20, verse 12, if we've come to Christ and we've dwelled with him for a thousand years in the millennium, how will the whole thing end? There is an insight that I gained in verse 12 that changed my life. Verse 12, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. So we're here to be judged. And the books were opened. And another book. So I've got books and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things were written in the books. 
according to their works. Now, judgment, assessment in any form, is when you compare what's actually going on with some standard. So, for example, a policeman sitting in a car watching traffic, he's comparing the law, which is the standard, with how people are driving. So, it's no different here. Jesus opens the book of my life. Let's see what you did, Bryce. Let's see what you thought, what you said, what kind of person you were. Let's see what you became. And that's the book of life. Now, the question is, what are the books? Well, I have no authority to define what that is. I am a nobody, but... One day I was reading that, asking myself, what are the books that are going to – what's the standard that he's going to compare my life to? And the thought came to me that he's going to open up the scriptures. The books are the scriptures. In other words, my life is going to be compared to the very scriptures he gave me from the very beginning. There's no secret questions on the test. There's no secret final. The master teacher isn't going to pop out some question that I wasn't prepared for and say, answer this question on the final. The questions are simply the very things I've been given. Now, if the Book of Mormon is my standard, let's suppose the book for me, since I'm a Latter-day Saint and I was raised in the Latter Days, and the book of Scripture in our day is primarily the Bible and the Book of Mormon— then my job is to become what the Book of Mormon teaches me to become. Now, let me tell you why that gives me a great deal of hope. I love Jesus with all my soul, but comparing myself to him can be incredibly intimidating because I don't know when I will ever be fully like him. Now, I try my best, but when we compare ourselves to Jesus, it seems a little overwhelming. But what about comparing myself to Alma the Younger? If the book of my comparison, if the standard is to be like Alma the Younger. That seems obtainable. I can be an Alma the Younger. I can be a Nephi. I can be in Captain Moroni's army. I can be a stripling warrior. And I think the message here is God will compare us to the standard he gave us from the very beginning. Live like those in this book lived. And all of a sudden, I just that changes the way I look at judgment. If the Lord said, look, I just asked you to be like the people in the Book of Mormon. Can you be forgiving of your brothers like Nephi was? Can you overcome your sins like Alma the Younger did? Can you be accepting of other people like the Nephites did in this situation? And now all of a sudden, that is a very, very doable thing for my life that gives me a great deal of hope for the judgment day. Anyway, I don't know if that's valuable, but I I share that thought to say you don't have to be perfect. I like that. This is from Ezekiel 33, and it talks about You know, in verse 15, it says, If the wicked restore the pledge and give again that he had robbed and walk in the statutes of life, and statutes, we're back to that book or that law, that which is written, without committing iniquity, he shall surely live and he shall not die. And I love verse 16. None of his sins that he has committed shall be mentioned to him. When I picture judgment, I believe this, that when I meet the Savior, I'm going to be filled with, in my mind, the images of all the things that I did where I fell short. And that really is what it means to sin. Sin means I'm shooting at the mark and I miss. I miss the mark. And that's the mortal experience. And I picture in my mind's eye that the Savior doesn't even mention that to me. I love verse 16. He's not going to, none of his sins that he has committed shall be mentioned to him. And I don't know where the verse is, Bryce. I know you know this, but it talks about if I repent, it says, I, the Lord, will remember their sins no more. 58. Is it section 58? Mm-hmm. I believe that God knows my sins. I, the way I read it is God's not going to mention them. He's not going to harp on them. He's not going to bring them up. And the reason why is through repentance. It's not that I'm great. It's but that he is. He is great. And so the 21st chapter is, is about this, starting in verse 1. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. The chaos is conquered. Uh, That's my reading of it. I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. This, a lot of this is coming out of the Book of Mormon. The idea of the city of Enoch is going to come back to earth, and 
This is in Moses where we fall on each other's necks and we embrace each other. This is, we're back to family. We're back to a family reunion with our loved ones and we're feasting. Verse three, I heard a great voice out of heaven. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God and God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes. Verse six, he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. There's Revelation 3.21 again. That's the osis. That's section 84. He's going to give everything to the saints. And I love the end of verse 7. It says, I will be his God and he shall be my son. So that is, that's the reunion in this chapter. Now there's an interesting image and it starts at about verse 10 where there's the Holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven. And I'm not going to read all the verses, but you can read them, especially verse 16, you might want to read. It's a massive city and it's a it's a perfect cube. And it says that it's 12,000 furlongs. That's a big, big thing. Uh, a furlong was a stadia. And you can read this right out of your footnotes, about 607 English feet or 185 meters. Um, there's some really good pictures. I might put some of this in the show notes of like, how big is that? It's big. We're talking Gulf of Mexico big. We're talking a big cube coming out of heaven. Why is it significant that it was a cube, Mike? Yeah, good question. The Holy of Holies yeah. was a cube. Yeah. In other words, the whole earth is inside the temple. Yeah. There is no temple. Once this earth becomes a celestial kingdom, notice it says there's no sun. Verse 22, no temple. Verse 23, no sun, because the whole earth has become the presence of God, and there is no need for a temple. We are in the presence of yeah. God the whole time. Significant that it's a cube. Yeah. The cube imagery, if you've ever heard the pearly gates, I had a lot of Catholic friends growing up, and they would talk about the pearly gates. And I remember going, what's the pearly gates? And if you look in 2121, it says there's 12 gates, and they were 12 pearls. And so that's where that's coming from. It's a city. Now, how symbolic and how literal is this? You know, I'm not going to get into what, what is what, but I do want to talk a little bit about this is the Holy of Holies. In the midst of this Holy of Holies are some really important images. And so you're, you're going to want to read these and highlight these. There's going to be a throne and there's, in my opinion, going to be thrones. There's a tree in the middle of this Holy of Holies that has, this is all chapter 22, there's water coming out of this Holy of Holies, clear as crystal, verse one. And then there's a street in verse two with a tree and it has fruit and it gives fruit every month and it heals us. And notice verse five of 22, there's no night, there's no artificial light, everything is light. And this whole chapter, that basically these two chapters are encapsulating the Holy of Holies, the image of the sacred stones in the 21st chapter. If you look in verses 19 and 20, those are stones of the uh, high priest. And so this is first Israelite temple religion. There was a tree in the Holy of Holies and it represented God. Now, a lot of this has been lost through the editing of the Bible, but I believe that Nephi and Lehi are putting this stuff back. And so this is Mike Day Midrash, but but work with me here. In the entire vision, the fundamental main point of First Nephi is get to the tree. The tree is a message, and it's a symbol, and it's a symbol for God. It's also a symbol for Heavenly Mother. It's a symbol for, in my opinion, Father and Mother inviting us home. This tree, and by the way, this tree is in all ancient Near Eastern texts. This tree in Egypt, they have the goddess is feeding the children from the tree. And so what does Nephi see when he sees it, right? He sees the mother of the son of God. These are layered images, but it's this idea of coming home. And I believe John is repackaging first Israelite temple religion, and he's trying to root the Christians in this theology and say, it's Jesus who brings us home. And this stuff was had in the first temple. It was edited. It was changed. We had the Jewish apostasy, but John's putting it back. The Bible begins and ends with a tree. The tree represents God, the love of God. And there's all layers to, to ways to read this. But I love how the Book of Mormon, you know, Joseph Smith doesn't understand any of this stuff. And he's 23, 24 years old, and he's producing a text, which is restoring these ancient notions of family, 
reunion, God, the tree, the Holy of Holies. And it's, if you, if all you had was first Nephi, it's all right there. It's just, to me, it's fascinating and it's layered and it's wonderful. And there's a lot of scholarship on this. Probably my favorite scholar is a, a Methodist lady. Her name's Margaret Barker, and she's written a number of books where she talks about how the Bible has been heavily edited and the importance of this stuff. And so I'll, I'll cite some of this in the show notes, but really you just got to read her stuff. I mean, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, hundreds of pages, I'm not kidding on what's happening here. And John is restoring this. So I love it. I love it, Bryce. It's good stuff. It is. And as we come to the end of this book, I think that's the message. Notice in verse four, they shall see his face and his name shall be on their forehead. How many times in the book of Revelation does that message keep coming back? Get Jesus on you. Put him right on your forehead. Wear him. Love him. Sing the song of redeeming love. Because in the end, it's about getting Jesus into your life. And so we kind of culminate in verse 7, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Do the things that we found in this book that he told us to do. Put the name of the Father on your forehead. Wear him. Learn the song. Stay away from the imitation. Avoid the harlot and her intoxicating wine. All the things that he's trying to teach us in this book, do it, and everything's going to be okay. I end my comments on the book of Revelation back in chapter 21, verse 4. Mike alluded to this verse. Someday, when all is done, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Jesus will come into your life, and he will wipe away the tears, and he will throw his arms around you. You can have that experience today, regardless of the day in which you live, whether or not you see his face coming down from the heavens in the se- at the second coming. Get him into your life, and he will wipe away the tears With all my soul, I testify that Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the way. Jesus is everything. Love him, learn of him, follow after him, live like him, act like he acts, love like he loves, and everything's going to be okay. So with that, we thank you for listening. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe. And if you haven't already, go check out our YouTube channel called Talking Scripture. On that channel, Bryce and I have been working on some new video content. These new videos are in addition to the regular podcasts that Bryce and I do together and supplements to your Come Follow Me study. And we'll leave a link in the description. Once again, thanks for joining us and make it a great week. Talking Scripture is not an official production of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The opinions expressed in this podcast are Mike and Bryce's opinions only. We refer you to official church sources and the church website to clarify any doctrinal questions.